culture, no doubt about it. But getting the real story about what happens on the inside or their influence in America, that's not easy. Wise guys don't usually keep diaries, you know what I mean? What happens with the mob often happens on the streets, like in the part of Brooklyn where I'm from. And that's exactly what this show is all about, getting the story from the guys who were there. You know, you may not like what you see, but hey, nobody's putting a gun to your head now, are they? Here in the marshes across the harbor from Manhattan, it's not unusual for something dumped years ago to resurface. Or somebody. This is where they found them. Right here on Staten Island. CSI said he had been dead for about a year. From the holes in his head, looked like a mob hit. The FBI figured out, most likely, he was a wise guy named Sonny Black. Before you ask me if they used his fingerprints to identify him, I'll tell you that the corpse didn't have any fingers. His hands had been cut off. The word on the street was that's because they shook the hands of Donnie Brasco, AKA Joe Pistone, the guy who betrayed the mob, the guy who got in deeper than any Fed had before. Most times the body washes up and scares the civilians. This time the body shook the mafia to its very core. Hey, but don't take my word for it. Listen to the wise guys who were there. It was the 1970s, and in New York, the mob was on a roll. The five families supposedly had their hands into just about everything. Construction, protection, gambling. Mob insiders say that if you ever had a problem doing business, just hold a gun to someone's head. Then, all of a sudden, it's no problem. It would seem that in the mob, murder was just business as usual. Ask this former wise guy from the Bonanno crime family. He'll set you straight. I mean, you kill more than one person. You gotta be a serial killer, right? Right? A lot of serial killers running around out there. Certain guys want to show force, you know? They want to show that they're the toughest guy around. Or you know, you know, don't mess with that guy. He killed more people than cancer, you know what I mean? How did they dispose of all those bodies? Hey. It was like taking out the trash. If you don't want the guy to be found, they'd cut up the body, change sort of body, put it in plastic uh, garbage bags, take it out and dump it in the ocean. How how you leave the guy depends on what kind of message you want to you want to leave, and what the guy's transgression was. And almost from the time you landed at JFK, before you even got to the city, well you might get a whiff of what was going down. Well, some ladies just flew in from Canada and she's walking through the parking lot at Kennedy Airport and smells this strange aroma coming from the trunk of her car. And then they open it up and there's uh, Joe been in there for three months. Long-term parking, real long. <laughs> There were evidently quite a few Joes who wound up dead. But there was one Joe who had other plans. His name was Joe Pistone. He was an FBI agent. He was about to go undercover to enter that forbidden world. And he was willing to risk everything to do it. What made him think he could pull it off? Well, let's just say he wasn't some FBI suit and wingtips. To work deep cover long term, you have to be mentally tough, more so physically. I mean, it, it, it takes a physical person, but the whole uh, secret of 
undercover is being mentally tough. But mental toughness could only get you so far. The inner workings of the Mafia were hidden from outsiders by a stone wall of silence. The only way to learn was to get inside the belly of the beast, to gather the hard evidence he would need to take it down. And this was one guy who went into it with his eyes open. Pistone had already been an FBI agent for seven years. He knew what the mob would do to him if they found out he was a Fed. Well, with a mob guy, if you're considered a snitch, you're, you know, lower than well done. If you're sending a message that the guy was a snitch, then you want the body to be found, uh, you know, maybe with the, a canary in his mouth. Uh, that's, you know, because a guy liked to sing, canaries sing. So the one thing you don't want to be found out or suspected of is being a snitch or an informant. The FBI set up a fake identity for Joe Pistone under the name Donnie Brasco. Pistone had a wife and kids, but as Donnie Brasco, he would have to leave them behind. I had a, uh, a birth certificate that was made up, you know. I went, got a legitimate driver's license, took the test, everything. Went, got an apartment, and uh, went and got a checking account. You know, had, had cash, just opened up a checking account. Pistone knew that plenty of mobsters were on the lookout for feds. In fact, some wise guys were paranoid about the FBI 24-7. Some guys I knew were insane, paranoid, you know, everybody was an FBI agent, and, uh, you know, everybody's watching them. Uh, everything was the FBI, and everything was cops and surveillance, and everything's a van with cameras in it, you know. Not Pistone. He was going in there with no backup, no surveillance. He was going in there buck naked. I had no backup during the course of the operation. The places that uh, hung out weren't conducive to surveillance. Pistone slipped into his new identity as a small-time jewel thief named Donnie Brasco. He hung out at a place in Manhattan called Carmella's, hoping to make some contact with the mob. But after six months, all he had to show for it was one hell of a bar tab. And then he got a break. He made contact with Tony Mira, a wise guy involved in fencing stolen property. In the mob, they called it swag. And Tony Mira, well, this guy was a piece of work. Tony Mira was a made guy in the Bonanno family who basically uh, was a money maker. He was involved in uh, gambling, had spent time in jail for narcotics. He was great at uh, muscling in on uh, clubs and restaurants and getting a kickback from them for protection. He was just a money machine for the Bonanno family. He was just outwardly uh, loud, obnoxious. He's probably the meanest guy that I, that I knew in the mob. He would get frightened from meeting any of those guys, some more gruff than others. Tony Mayer was one of the more gruff, intimidating guys, you know. Wasn't a big, happy guy. <laughs> Mira hooked Pistone up with a small-time thug and habitual gambler named Lefty Ruggiero, who worked for the Bonanno crime family. The Bonanos? We're talking one of New York's five crime families. Insiders say they had been a force to contend with in the mob since Prohibition. Members of the Bonanno family were feared as ruthless killers who would die rather than reveal their secrets. And no Fed had ever been able to penetrate the family. But all that was about to change. Because Pistone figured that just maybe Lefty, a loyal Bonanno soldier, could be his ticket to the inside. Lefty was a 24-hour-a-day gangster. I mean, he was just a... The only way I can explain is a 24-hour gangster. He was a real mob gangster. He generated money, but he was a gambler, degenerate gambler, so he never had money. But he, he had the ability to generate money, but he just never had it. Like a lot of mobsters, no matter how much money Lefty brought in, his pockets were always empty. He lived with his family in the housing projects and sometimes sunk to stealing quarters from parking meters. Lefty Ruggiero was just kind of dopey from what I remember. Um, could be very violent when he needed to, but uh, and I and heard that he killed a lot of guys. 
you could tell that Lefty was a stone killer just by his actions and just the way he looked at you. He never really discussed with me any of his previous hits, but he, you know, he told me what the best method to hit somebody. You know, when you kill somebody, you, you, you put two behind the ear, you know, with a 22, because it, it'll go and rattle around in the head. What rattled around in Pistone's head was that he better keep his story straight as Donnie Brasco, or he'd wind up dead. Because as Joe got to know Lefty, he discovered that he wasn't just skilled with a gun. He had something else, a killer memory. He would recall conversations six, eight months later that we had, and they were verbatim. <laughs> so he was a guy that you always had to be on your toes as far as remembering what you said to him and you know what you said you would do or couldn't do. If Lefty had found one thing about Joe Pistone's alias that didn't add up, well, don't even think about that. But so far, Donnie had passed the test. Lefty bought his story, and the mobster took Joe Pistone under his wing. During all the years that I knew Lefty and became friendly with him, he was always educating me on the ways of the mob and the ways of a mob guy. The thing that mattered to Lefty, the one thing that gave him self-respect, was that he was a made guy. It gave him a chance to feel superior to everyone who wasn't. In the Mafia, when you uh, when they say you're going to get made or straightened out or get your button, it means you're going to be officially indoctrinated into that particular Mafia family. In the mob, being a member is serious business. Just ask this former wise guy. Once you get a button, remember you own that McDonald's franchise. You don't have that button, you're nothing. Because Cosa Nostra is all about being a member. And for Lefty, being a member was what made life worth living. One time we asked Lefty, what's the advantage of being a made guy, you know? Why would I want to be a made guy when I have so many rules to follow? And with a straight face and and not cracking Lefty, you know, he's, he got like, what are you, crazy? He said, you can lie, you can steal, you can cheat, you can kill, and it's all legitimate if you're a made guy. Yeah, that was his outlook. That was his mindset. But being a made guy also carried with it other social perks. You know, when you're a guy that really hasn't done anything significant in your life and you walk into a restaurant and it's a Friday night and there's doctors and lawyers and people that are saving people's lives every day and we're waiting on the sidewalk to get a table and you walk up to the door and you're a snot those 21 21-year-old kid and they take you in first. Let me tell you something. It's like a shot of ego, boy. It's like, it's like a drug that you can't even imagine. The question was, did Agent Joe Pistone have the mental toughness to resist the temptations of mob life? Pretty soon, his resolve would be tested. A hit was about to go down that would shake the Bonanno crime family to its very core and threaten to blow Joe Pistone's cover. It was the summer of 1979. For almost three years, FBI undercover agent Joe Pistone had risked his life, living as Donnie Brasco inside the Bonanno crime family. Donnie knew he was playing the odds. Hour by hour, the danger ramped up. For Donnie, Tapping into the mob's secrets was hard enough. Even harder, he had to get those secrets out. You think he wore a wire? Most of the time, forget about it. Which made the FBI technical squad not so happy. Yeah, I, I knew Joe and, you know, definitely we were supporting technically where he was going and what he was doing when he was so inclined to cooperate. He didn't cooperate a whole lot, though. He was pretty much under so long and so deep that too much cooperation with the, the technical requirements to be wired, et cetera, were not in his personal best interest. And, you know, that, that's where you get into the balancing act between what's good for the FBI and what's good for the undercover operative. The stone had to be so careful, he never wrote anything down. I never made notes every couple of days if I had anything that was of evidentiary value, I would phone it into one guy and he would reduce it to paper. Because you know what you need for court. 
and to keep the conversation straight and to keep in your head what's of ev evidentiary value because you can't fill your head with every bit of conversation because you'll never remember what you need to remember. I mean, you know, you figure you're in 500 conversations a day. <laughs> you know, you're not going to remember everything. So stuff that, that had nothing to do with illegal activities didn't make any difference to me. To soak up information, Pistone spent a lot of time at the social club, where a dozen or so members of his crew hung out to talk over mob business. Being on the inside had a price, because the day came when he was sure he would never walk out of there alive. It was the day somebody smelled a rat. Well, there were moments when I thought I was going to get killed. Sure, that was the, the time in the social club with the guys locking the door. I had to talk my way out. You know, guys braced me, uh, and uh, I had to explain to them that I was really Donnie Brasco, jewel thief. It, your, your personality doesn't click with everybody, and these two guys just didn't like me. And uh, we locked up in the back room of the social club one day and told a phone call could prove to them that I wasn't a rat. And they said if I didn't prove it to them, you know, if they if I couldn't convince them I was going to come out of here rolled up in a rug, you know. So I was pretty tense for about seven, eight hours. Even for someone used to living on the edge, things were about to get a lot edgier. Because the Bonanno crime family was due for a major shakeup. Let's just say, if the mob was a corporation, then this one was due for a major corporate takeover. The method of climbing the ladder and uh, the method of eliminating your uh, opposition is a little different. <laughs> you climb the ladder over somebody's body and you eliminate the opposition by killing them in the mob. So, just like corporate America. There was a bit of a power struggle going on. It was shortly after Carmine Galanti had taken over uh, as boss of the crime family. There were factions that disliked him. Mafia expert Jerry Capisi has kept his finger on the pulse of the mob. Carmine Galanti was a drug dealer from New York City who um, was uh, a cutthroat gangster who moved to the top of the Bonanno crime family in uh, 1976 or so when he got out of prison, uh, who was um, disliked quite a bit. Disliked as in he was about to become history. But when you hit a mob boss, you have to get a nod from the commission. In the corporate world, make that the board of directors. The killing of uh, Carmine Galante was approved by the Mafia's commission, the ruling uh, board, uh, which was all involved in approving the execution of uh, the boss of the Bonanno crime family. The commission was a council of the most powerful Mafia families in the country. When it came to whacking a mob boss, they called the shots. And they also said who fired them. It's got to be somebody close to you, somebody you're comfortable with, somebody you'll get in a car with, you'll let your guard down with. You know, they come to you as your friend. You, know, you get in the car, you think you're going to uh, to the track with three guys, except one of you's never come back. Tuesday on FX, Marie has a hunger for evil. Like I can tell you're excited. That ah! Hey, what are you, some kind of a freak? <sighs> and a taste for Italian. Come on, baby. Relax. <laughs> now the undead and the undercover are teaming up. You lost a lot of blood. Are you sure you don't need more? Don't worry. You're not my type. To take a bite out of crime. Michelli's not dead, is he? Welcome to the family. <laughs> Innocent Blood. Tuesday at 9 on FX. What are you doing, dear? You said we could save money on our home insurance with a mouse in a net. No, dear, the internet. Hmm? We just visit esure.com, and in a few clicks we cut out the middleman and could save ourselves a tidy sum. That's much! So where's this mouse? Meet Mr. Mouse. <laughs> Calm down, dear, it's only a mouse. <whistles> esure.com, it pays to let your mouse protect your house. <laughs> No, 
nice car, mate. New Astra Sport Hatch. Go drive. Is this the help desk? I need help. What kind of help? Dinosaurs and robots and outer space and why the sky is blue. Lots of stuff. Don't you learn that in school? I don't go to school. It's too far. I live on a farm in China. I see. Is there room for me over there? We're virtual. There's always room. Yes. Help desk. Sopadine Max has the power to attack pain fast, like PA pain and even migraine. There is no stronger pain relief available without prescription. The president use only the Emmental from the heart of the wheel, giving you only the sweet, nutty cheese that's just irresistible. President. Of course, I used to be a biker. Great days. Yeah, man. The freedom. I used to ride a Harley. Karaoke 325. I had a BSMA. It's the sound of freedom. Man, it burns through your soul. I'll definitely do it again. When? Next week. Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, 118 Hello, is that Hot Wheels? Motorcycle. Bike. Leathers. Guildford. Hey, no! No! Right! Hello. Yellow Pages, yell.com or 118 Whatever you want, just yell. Oi, Churchill, could you save me up to 30% of my car insurance? Oh, yes. With 24-hour assistance if I have an accident? Yes. A five-year guarantee on repairs? Yes. A courtesy car while you're fixing mine? Oh, yes. Ooh, and can I have my own personal chauffeur called Les? Uh, no. But I could still save up to 30% of my car insurance? Oh, yes. See how much you could save on your car insurance. Give the dog a phone now on 0800 200 300 or log on to churchill.com. I love you. Study now. When you come on holiday to Ireland, remember, we've got the odd ghost or two. So you better bring the family. Safety in numbers. Oh, and while you're at it, bring a fishing rod. Maybe even a saddle or two. You can do a lot in Ireland or relax with a few friends. Stay in a self-catering cottage or luxurious castle in Ireland, the island of memories. Why not give us a call or visit tourismireland.com. You take care of your body by exercising and eating right. One of the easiest ways to take care of your body is to brush properly. Ask your dentist what sonic toothbrushes can do. Sonicare, because your mouth is the gateway to your body. Thursdays on FX Comedy. Everyone's favourite family guy kicks things off at nine. Okay, buddy. Ah! Maybe you don't have to pee. Hey, I ought to just give you some beer. It goes right through you. Wonderful. And while we're at it, we can light up a doobie and watch porn. Yeah? Followed by The Law, Nevada Star with Reno 911 at 9.30. All units in the vicinity. Bombs are down. Shots fired. Shots fired. Sheriff's Department! We got an officer down. Next up, it's Penn and Teller at 10. Honest, no BS. I'm Penn, this is my partner Teller. We're gonna take a look into the heart of love. Could it be bullshit? Then Kenny versus Spenny face off at 10.35. This is the who is a better male stripper competition. I'm gonna do some sexy dancing for you tonight. Oh! FX comedy, all starting Thursdays at nine on FX. The way the mob took care of Carmine Galanti was a mob specialty. As close to their hearts as the modernata sauce at a certain Italian restaurant in Brooklyn. As for Galanti's bodyguards, no problem. He was having dinner um, at Joe and Mary's Italian restaurant in Bushwick section of Brooklyn. Uh, his bodyguards, as it turned out, were uh, intimately involved in the uh, slaying. As it turned out, two of the guys that, that were supposedly his bodyguards were actually in on the hit, uh, Caesar Bonaventure and uh, Amato, and um, they were Sicilians uh, that Glenty had brought over uh, from Sicily uh, over to the U.S., and uh, they turned on him. 
Carmine Galante was clipped so fast, he didn't even have time to take the cigar out of his mouth. Even though he was in prison, Rusty Rustelli became the new boss of the Bonanno crime family. For over 10 years from behind bars, Rusty dictated what came down on the street. One of Rusty's captains was named Sonny Black, and now Lefty and Joe Pistone answered to Sonny. He was the kind of guy that when you met him, you knew you, you, knew you had to respect him, and you knew that if you didn't, that uh, he'd have no problem, <laughs> you know, he'd have no problem whacking you. Sonny Black had quite a reputation among other members of the mob. Sonny Black I met as a kid. Um, he was a tough guy. He was, didn't seem like he was the most intelligent guy in the world. But uh, you know, he was aggressive, Sonny. That's why he became a captain. You know, these guys kill you in a hobby. If a guy's a captain, there's a reason why he's a captain. <laughs> you know, which basically means you killed some people along the way. If Sonny Black had a warm spot in his heart for any living thing, it was for the pigeons he kept in a coop up on his roof. As for the wise guys and his crew, they weren't exactly the warm, fuzzy type. Everybody in Sonny Black's crew was a killer. So the intensity of the, of the, the aspect of violence that he faced exceeded mine probably 50 times over. Working for Sonny Black's crew took Brasco deeper into the mob than any other FBI agent in history. How did he pull it off? Donnie impressed his new boss in the one place where he did the most good, his wallet. Donnie got closer to Sonny, and Sonny got closer to Donnie because Donnie was making money for Sonny. And so with his FBI backing, and with the ability to sell swag and get swag and, uh, and get involved in all kinds of money-making operations, he was able to convince these guys that he was an earner. He was a big guy. He could make money for them. So it made it easier for Donnie to earn their trust. He was a half-assed wise guy who was on the way up, and he was their guy. As Donnie's relationship with Sonny Black deepened, he found out he had something in common with this mob boss. Each had a dark, secret life that he kept from his family. Sonny had kids that he took care of. Uh, and you know, you come to think of it, it's not, it's not so much like an undercover agent. You know, how, how are you out there working undercover all the time, doing what you do, and then when you get a chance to go to your family, you're like, you know, you're back to being a family man. It was the same thing with these guys. You know, they're they're out there robbing, stealing, cheating, killing, uh, and then on Sunday afternoon they're sitting home with their wife, their mother, and whoever ha having a Sunday meal. You know, maybe Saturday night they just killed somebody. Being in Sonny Black's good graces gave Pistone the leverage to try to set up deals with other mob families. After a scheme he tried to arrange between the Bananos and the Milwaukee mob went south, Pistone decided to go the same direction. I had been under now for like four years, and I had really been uh, in with these guys and not really uh, suspected of anything. And there was another undercover operation going down in uh, Tampa, Florida. Not only did the feds want Pistone to bring down the Bananos, they wanted a man with his connections and his nerve to bring down the Florida mob, headed by Santo Traficante. Traficante, uh, he was a quiet guy. I mean, the guy had never been to jail. <laughs> the guy had been a mob boss for years and had never been to jail. You know, he just ran his thing in Florida. Looked like your grandfather, you know. But uh, very powerful and obviously very ruthless when he had to be. Traficante was the mob's biggest fish in Florida, and the feds were out to gut him. So when they sent Pistone down to Tampa, it wasn't to work on his tan. The idea was brought up for me to go down there and see if I could get a marriage going between the Bananos and Traficante. This mob marriage wouldn't be made in heaven but at a small-time nightclub known as King's Court, 
set up by the FBI in the Florida town of Holiday. Holiday is a small town that's located about an hour northwest of Tampa, and that's actually where the King's Court was located. Being a small town like that, they were able to buy favor with local law enforcement that kind of you know, gave them the protection they needed to open up this Las Vegas style club and get some of these illegal gambling operations going in town. The FBI was counting on the one thing all the mob families had in common, their love of the folding green to get them hooked. They saw potential, you know, you got we got a nightclub going, running gambling operations out of there, and being in Florida, drugs. So uh, Sonny arranged a meeting through the bosses of New York with Traffic Candy. We had a couple meetings with Traffic Candy, we became partners with him, and that's where we went. The FBI wanted to ensnare Santo Traficante and members of the Traficante family, but also thought that when they brought Donnie Brasco or Joe Pistone down with the Bonanno crew, that they might be able to get you know, two, these two families working together on this operation and be able to make you know, a really big sweep of organized crime suspects. The King's Court nightclub was designed to do just that. Packed with hidden cameras and tape recorders, it was strictly state-of-the-art. Just ask the FBI point man on the job. I had sent down uh, a crew to actually do the installation of the club. We had installed the uh, audio video. I mean, we did a lot of work. The setup could have delivered a gold mine of information on the mob, but it all came crashing down. And not because the mob broke in on it. Would you believe the police? One evening at the King's Court, Lefty, Donnie, and company were holding a casino night. Supposedly it was all for charity, but it was really a scam. Acting on an anonymous tip, the police raided the place. So, Sonny Black and Pistone were thrown into the local jail, but Sonny smelled a rat. See, Pistone had nothing to do with the raid. In fact, the cops didn't even know he was a fed. But Pistone was getting nervous that he'll be found out. So he secretly arranged for the charges against Sonny Black to be dropped. That was a close one. But Donnie got himself in even more trouble because of some picture in a magazine. I had taken a bunch of wise guys that came from New York. We went down to Miami for a little vacation. I had taken them out on the boat that was used as the Abscam boat, another FBI undercover operation. Pistone was using an FBI boat to take his mob friends for a ride, which would have been okay if nobody found out. But when they published a picture of the FBI's boat, that almost sank Donnie Brasco. Because of a, uh, a press leak, they surfaced that operation early, and the picture of the boat appeared in, I think it was Newsweek. And uh, Lefty saw it, and uh, he questioned me on it, and I. I had to talk my way out of that with him. It looked like Pistone could talk his way out of anything. But he was about to face a new problem that even he couldn't talk his way out of. Because Sonny Black was rising in the organization, he was taking Pistone with him. And making it big in the mob, well, that's a good way to get yourself whacked. He was always telling me that they all expect they, that they're going to get whacked. You know, if you're in this thing and you become somebody of power, that you expect that uh, somebody's going to try to knock you down. And by knocking you down, it's killing you, getting you out of the way so they can take your position. Somebody was about to try to clip Sonny Black. So Sonny was going to ask Donnie to do him this little favor, as in pull the trigger and blow his problem away. If the boss tells you you got to kill somebody and you don't kill them, then you're going to get killed. It was 1981. Joe Pistone had lived and worked undercover in the Bonanno crime family for over five dangerous years. Pistone knew time was not on his side, and he knew that if he had slipped up, his first mistake would be his last. But under all the lies and deceptions, something amazing was happening. A spark had been ignited between FBI undercover agent Joe Pistone and Sonny Black. These two very different men had started up a genuine friendship. I'll be honest with you, I, Sonny Black probably was the kind of guy that, uh, 
If I wasn't an agent, I, you know, I could see myself hanging out with him, not becoming involved in criminal activities, but you know, having a beer with him or going to dinner with him. I mean, and not not discussing criminal activities because you can talk to him, you know, about normal stuff. One day, Sonny Black asked Donnie a question that showed how deep his trust really went. We were in a conversation in the Motion Lounge, I think it was, and he said, Donnie, he said, you know, basically everybody in this life, chances are you're going to get whacked or killed. He said, I want you to promise me that, you know, you look out after my kids if anything happens to me. You know, you make sure that, uh, that they're taken care of. Even then, maybe Sonny Black could smell the threat to his life, because not everyone in the organization was so jazzed about Sonny's success. In fact, a mobster who went by the name Sonny Red and his crew didn't appreciate Sonny Black's new clout in the Bonanno crime family. Sonny Red was my Uncle Philly's partner. He used to talk to himself in the bathroom, from what I understand. He was, <laughs> he was, he was a little insane, but uh, he was another guy that was known to be extremely violent. Insiders say that Sonny Black got wind that Sonny Red had plans to whack him. So Sonny Black decided to do unto others before they did unto him. In April 1981, Sonny Black set up a hit on three rebel captains, including Sonny Red. Another victim scheduled for the ambush was Uncle Philly. The day that he went to the meeting, my uncle was having a cup of coffee, and I forget he was getting dressed and walking around, and my aunt was cooking breakfast or whatever. And uh, the phone rang, and uh, there was somebody on the phone who just said, tell Philly not to go to the meeting, and he hung up. And that was it. So I told my uncle that somebody just called and said to tell you not to go to the meeting. And just, he said, okay. That was it, he left. That was the last time I saw him. His uncle joined his wise guy friends for their last supper. Only thing was, they didn't know it yet. From what I understand, they, they went to a sit down, they weren't armed, and uh, they were waiting for them there. The sit down, I believe, was somewhere in Brooklyn. I heard that uh, one guy said when he shot Trini, when he shot him in his stomach, all the pasta came out. You know, I guess they had just to eat. I was, you know, I've heard that before. My uncle, they never found. Pistone wasn't there for the bloodbath, but it didn't take him long to learn that one of the intended victims got away. Sonny Red's son, Bruno and Delicati. Sonny Red, they found in uh, a little hole dug in the park. It wasn't covered or anything. They wanted Sonny to be found, so uh, they figured if Sonny's body was found, then his son would come out, and that would be a way for them to kill his son. Sonny Red's son, Bruno, according to those who knew him, was a stone killer. Sonny Black's crew feared payback from Bruno, big time. Suddenly, Along with the rest of Sonny Black's crew, Pistone was dressed heavy. It wasn't until after the three, these three captains were killed that everybody was carrying a gun. And uh, Sonny had given me a, uh, a gun to carry. Pistone got the message. He wasn't just expected to carry a gun. He was expected to use it to whack Bruno and Delicati, who had escaped the ambush. When Sonny called me in and uh, gave me the contract to uh, to kill uh, Bruno, of course, I, I couldn't refuse it because that would have been suspicious. But of course, I couldn't carry it out either because I was a, an undercover agent, so I couldn't uh, whack Bruno. For Pistone, this contract on Bruno was the ultimate compliment. It meant his boss was ready to make him a made guy. Getting that contract with, uh, to kill Bruno from Sonny was very significant because it, it, it meant uh, Proposed me for membership was uh, was on the up and up that he you know he was gonna propose me for membership and I would have been inducted at the end of the year. But getting the contract was the thing Pistone had dreaded all along. I knew it was a matter of time that I would be asked to be involved in a hit because I mean that's one of the, uh, the requirements for getting getting inducted is that you make your bones you kill somebody. Suddenly it looked like Joe Pistone had no way out. If he stayed and pulled off the hit, he was a killer. If he said he wouldn't do it, he was dead meat. One thing that you have to remember uh, that I got to know about Sonny Black was that uh, Sonny could be and was a stone-cold killer. As much as I got along with him 
and the relationship we had, there was no doubt in my mind that if Sonny thought I was a snitch, uh, that he would have whacked me. You know, if the, if the bosses make a decision, then that's the way it's gonna be. And if you got a problem with it being that way, then you'll just disappear. That's the answer to many problems. <laughs> How Joe Pistone handled his little problem would become the ultimate test of whether he got out alive or not. Wednesday on FX. Open it. Oh my God, oh my God, I'm going to call the police. Wait a minute, that's my card. You give that to the detectives when oh, they're You're supposed to stay here. Why didn't you stay at the crime scene? Are you accusing me of something? Davey Blaylock was murdered, he was shot in the back of the head. What did you have to do with it? I hope to God you know what I had to do with it. You're not looking to saw the branch off behind me, are you, Teddy, saying you didn't know about this? Murder One, new episode, Wednesday at 9 on FX. Everyone has a passion. What's yours? Being in control. What's your buzz? Freedom! This is ours, BP Ultimate. In petrol and diesel, more performance, better responsiveness, more mileage, less pollution. This is our ultimate. What's yours? Tina! We won't be a second! Should we? Nah. More than give you a car insurance quote in a couple of minutes. It's dead easy. Lucky. Uh, nice car, Tom. Yeah. Hey, look, I've got my quote. That's lucky. And it says I could save even more if I buy online. <sighs> That's more than lucky. Save more on car insurance when you buy online at morethan.com. Actimel contains the good bacteria LC Immunitas. Try it and see if you feel the difference. Mm, there none. Starte etwas. Start a show. Start something. Démarrer une expérience intelligente. Start mixing and mashing. Start anything you like. Begin met iets fotografisch. Die fantastico. Start something beautiful. Start anything you like. With a world of software and devices that run on Windows, the choice is yours. The front ones are really sensitive. There'll be like a sharp pain. I had to start ordering a straw with my cold drinks. If you're trying to impress a guy and you order a straw and you look like a little girl drinking through a straw all the time. <laughs> He recommended I try a toothpaste specifically designed for sensitive teeth. The next time I went shopping, I bought Sensodyne. But now I can just get a glass of water from the fridge, drink it and not have to worry. It's just sorted out my problem. It cleans my teeth, it gives me fresh breath. What more do you need? While you're watching telly, I'm doing my impersonation of you. Sampling the delights of Vegas. If someone stole your identity, it could be a year before you found out. By then, they could have plundered your savings and traveled the world in your name. Capital One is the first to offer free identity theft assistance to victims. Extravagant, aren't you? It comes with the Capital One No Hassle Platinum Card. What's in your wallet? Hellman's Two-Step Warm Chicken Salad Dressing. <laughs> Just two steps, as easy as it sounds. See life in 8.6 billion on-screen colors with Panasonic's new Viera Plasma TV and record it in brilliant quality with Panasonic's Digger Multi-Format DVD recorders. Panasonic. Ideas for life. Oh, yeah! Yeah, I'm all right. See you in 15 minutes. Go, go, go! For fast relief from allergies, call on Benadryl. It's the only allergy capsule that starts working in just 15 minutes.
Benadryl. When we say it's fast, we mean it's fast. All clear. Fridays on FX. Arlen, Texas. The one place you can still find a real man. I am Mighty Thor! A real man drives a truck. Hank Hill, are you a man? You a real it. man knows how to operate power tools. I've been nominated for Texas Propane Woman of the Year. A real man drinks beer. You really think Hank's a woman? Not just your ideal of what a perfect woman would be? A real man protects his family from dangerous intruders. Dang it, I am not some redneck and I'm not a Hollywood jerk. I'm, I'm complicated. Real men watch King of the Hill, the new series Fridays at 6.30, only on FX. Once Sonny gave me the contract, obviously I, I, I accepted it, but obviously I couldn't kill Bruno because I was a FBI agent. So he was on the land because he knew he was going to get hit. From what I understand, that's the way it went. He just kept telling uh, Sonny Black stories that he couldn't catch up with him or he couldn't find him or, or uh, he was in Florida or he was here or there. So I actually went out looking for him, hoping that you know either I grabbed him or the FBI grabbed him and we snatched him off the street. The clock was ticking. The FBI saw only one way out for Joe Pistone, to pull the plug on Donnie Brasco, to end his six years undercover with the mob. Believe it or not, Pistone still didn't want out, and he told his boss at the FBI. The only thing we did have uh, little button heads over was that uh, uh, I wanted to continue until I got made, and uh, he was adamant that we closed it down because he was concerned about me getting killed. And uh, it was a decision that he made, and uh, I said, okay, I'll live with it. Pistone was not happy the operation was being shut down before he could be the first Fed ever to become a made man in the mob. My idea was, look, imagine the blow to the mafia when it finds out that they've inducted a, <laughs> an undercover FBI agent. In late June of 1981, with a mob war raging, the FBI pulled Joe Pistone out for his own safety. Donnie Brasco was history. Then the FBI showed up at Sonny Black's door and gave him the shock of his life. We had a couple of FBI agents that had known Sonny go to his apartment. And uh, they told him that, uh, they showed him a picture, I actually showed him my picture, said, do you know this guy? And he said, uh, yeah, maybe, I don't know. And they told him, well, he's an FBI agent. And Sonny said, well, if I, if I ever see him, then I'll know he's an FBI agent. And he's been undercover for six years. This has all been an FBI undercover operation. Basically, what they did was they wanted to give Sonny a chance to, to turn, to become an informant. After the, uh, the FBI pulled the plug on the undercover operation, uh, they decided to try and get some of these gangsters to cooperate. And one of them that they hoped would cooperate was Sonny Black. The FBI wanted Sonny Black to flip and help them out. But Pistone had played his part so well as Donnie Brasco, nobody bought the Fed story. And Sonny called uh, Lefty Ruggiero and told him what the agents had told him. And they didn't believe it. Uh, nobody believed it. They thought the FBI had uh, kidnapped me and they were brainwashing me, uh, make me an informant and then by telling that story that they would make them an informant. But uh, nobody became an informant. From what I understand and have heard from years later is that guys couldn't believe that he was a federal agent. It was a shock, you know. And the second that came out, Sonny Black had to know that he was dead. Sonny Black went up to the one place where he could think about his future with some old friends he knew would never betray him. After he got that word, he went up to uh, the roof of his uh, uh, building in Brooklyn and spent some time with his pigeon coops. He often uh, would spend up uh, time up on the roof uh, with his pigeons when he needed time to think and ponder uh, life's uncertainties, uh, as it were. Uh, that's what he did right after he was notified that uh, the guy who you thought was a close friend of yours was an FBI agent. And 17 days after that 
conversation that the FBI agents had with him, uh, Sonny disappeared. Uh, he went to a meeting and uh, <clears throat> never come back. But the amazing thing about Sonny was that uh, when he went to that meeting, I'm sure he knew he wasn't going to come back because he went into the motion lounge and gave the bartender his pinky ring, a bunch of cash, and the keys to his apartment and said, I got to go to a meeting. And uh, he left and he never came back. So to me, that meant that he knew he wasn't coming back from that meeting. But he had the nerve to go to that meeting. Uh, and one, not become an informant, and two, not run. After Donnie Brasco's true identity as an FBI agent was revealed, Lefty Ruggiero was also a marked man. Lefty was uh, also due to get the hit, but uh, the FBI had wiretaps going at this time, and they intercepted the uh, conversation that uh, Lefty was on his way to get clipped, and they had agents surveilling him anyway, and they snatched him off the street, saved his life. He thought these guys were going to clip him. But once he found out they were agents, he was, he was pissed, he was ticked. Uh, and, uh, you know, he was a marked man, and he still didn't talk. I mean, you know, it was a mob contract that on him, but he still didn't talk. Lefty was arrested, sentenced to 15 years in jail, but nobody knew for sure what happened to Sonny Black. Shortly after Sonny Black disappeared, there was some question among the FBI brass as to whether he had run away, was on the lam, or he had been whacked. And I told the agents, I said, Sonny Black raised the racing pigeons. And I said, when you see them dismantling the cages on top of the motion lounge, I said, you know he's never coming back, that he's dead. And uh, shortly after that, they, they started to take some of the pigeon coops down. So we figured he was gone because he wouldn't dismantle his pigeon coops on his own. Nobody in the mob world talked about Sonny Black being dead. They just said he was away. It's something, I guess, that's inbred from the time they're small, you know? I mean, uh, guys uh, think nothing after they kill somebody. They think nothing of it. The guy's gone, he's gone. You know, where are we going to go eat tonight? Then one day, Sonny Black came back, at least most of them did, in a body bag here on Staten Island. And pretty soon, it looked like the Bonanno family was going to decompose as fast as Sonny Black's corpse. The day that Sonny Black's body was found on Staten Island, Joe Pistone, a.k.a. Donnie Brasco, was in court, paying off his undercover work trying to stick it to the mob. I was on a witness stand, actually, testifying in the first case when I found out that, it, that uh, they had found his body. Yeah. It told me, I, I don't know if it was lunchtime or whatever, but I was actually testifying when I found out they had found his body. I never wanted to see Sonny get killed. I mean, my whole... My whole deal was, my job was to put you in jail, not to kill you. But um, it had crossed my mind many times that chances are that Sonny would get whacked, Lefty would get whacked, because that's the code that they live by. They chose their path, not me. So they probably would have got killed one way or another anyway. Joe Pistone heard that the hands of Sonny Black had been chopped off. He had his own theory on the message that the mob was trying to send. When they found Sonny's body, he was in a body bag, and uh, his hands were cut off. And I take that to mean that the reason they cut his hands off was because he brought me around and introduced me to high-ranking members within the family and introduced me to Santo Traficani, boss of Florida family. And that was a sign that, uh, you know, he did the wrong thing by introducing me around and shaking hands with these people. With no hands, the CSI guys couldn't use fingerprints. But they finally did identify the body as Sonny's with dental records. They even charged a mob suspect with Sonny Black's murder. Recently, Joey Messina was charged with uh, Sonny Black's murder. It took a long time, but <laughs> the Bureau came around and uh, 
didn't drop the investigation and uh, you know if they prove it in court that it'd be a great coup you know what goes around comes around Messina's defense lawyer said it wasn't Sonny's body that was found FBI said it was well maybe it really didn't matter whether that body was Sonny Black or some other mob victim because what really haunted the mob wasn't the dead wise guy rotting out there it was the man with the smarts and the coyons who came out of this whole thing alive. Thanks to Joe Pistone's evidence and testimony, over a hundred wise guys went to jail, leaving the Bonanno crime family in pieces. Well, my operation discontinued when we uh, terminated it. The Bonanno family was pretty much in shambles. We convicted uh, most of the, the higher echelon of the family. I mean, the paranoia that uh, that was instilled just by me being there for six years and doing what I did and meeting the people that I, I met was like unbelievable. So you can imagine what it would have been if, if the induction had, had gone through. You know, they probably would have wiped, the commission probably would have killed the whole family. Even after all the damage Joe Pistone did to the Bonanno crime family, not one of Sonny Black's crew flipped to help the FBI. Lefty spent 15 years in a can and uh, never said a word either. None of them did. I mean, that's the old-time gangsters. They were all stand-up guys. You want to talk about stand-up guys. Look at Lefty Ruggiero. Not one of those guys that ever went to jail because of the stone came back and gave a bad story on him. Because as much as he hurt them, they wouldn't tell on somebody else. They couldn't be snitches. No matter what the stone did to them, how he betrayed them, they wouldn't say this, that, and anything. Maybe they wouldn't badmouth him, but to punish Pistone for how bad he had hurt them, the mob took out a contract. After they sorted everything out, when the indictments came down and they finally understood that uh, I was uh, I was an undercover agent, the commission put a $500,000 contract out on me. Yeah. And then they sent guys to all the different places over the country that I had been with these guys looking for me, but obviously they didn't find me. Pistone says that thanks to him, the mob had to change the rules. These days, it's a lot harder to join the mafia and harder for the FBI to penetrate it. I was the last guy to infiltrate to that level of the mafia families. They instituted a ruling, the commission, that uh, you had to have two guys vouch for you instead of one guy when they brought you around. And somebody had to say that they as, as far as making your bones or killing somebody, somebody had a vouch that you actually did the killing. Maybe they could change the membership rules, but the mob couldn't stop their organization. Six years undercover, the Donnie Brasco case, all the people that were arrested, that one guy became an informant. Now, you don't even have the handcuffs on him, I'm being told by agents, and uh, they, they want to make a deal about talking. Perhaps it can be said that no single person had a greater impact on the mob than Agent Joe Pistone. That being said, who can say the mob didn't have an effect on him? My personal thing is he probably got into the life and liked it. He lived with them. He was successful. That means he had to be a mob guy. He had to get it. I mean, he was there. He was in it. Mentally, psychologically, physically, and everything that has to do with it. Maybe there was a little bit of the mob in Joe Pistone. Maybe there had to be more than a little bit for Joe to do his job. Or is the dirty little secret that Joe Pistone learned that there's a little bit of the mob in all of us? A routine run on a quiet weekday morning would lead to a gruesome discovery. 
and thrust investigators into one of Australia's most bizarre murders. We'd never found him at all except for a boot and a pair of sunglasses. It became evident that robbery wasn't the motive. You ask yourself, well, what then is the motive? And the only thing that was going to identify that person for us was his DNA. It appeared to be someone who knew what they were doing, possibly even someone with medical skill. And then of all things, he went to his mother's birthday party. And it was at that time that we thought that we had a psychopathic killer on our hands.